Hello and welcome to World Inside with me, Tian Wei, coming to you from Beijing on CGTN. Today we are presenting to you a special program marking the bicentennial birth anniversary of Karl Marx, one of the world's most well-known philosophers who made almost a greater impact than any of his peers if you look at the history. But the world has changed much. How relevant are his theories? It is not a political debate, but rather an intellectual topic. Karl Marx is often described as one of the greatest thinkers of the 19th century. Born in 1818, Marx was 30 when he, along with his benefactor Frederick Engels, wrote the Communist Manifesto. Marx believed that capitalism, which was in its infancy at the time, had serious flaws. He claimed that in pursuit of production surplus or profit, capitalists would encourage their ideology that embraces mass production and exploits the working class. Class conflict then arises due to contradictions between the oppressed working class and the capitalist. It would lead to a proletarian revolution that would result in socialism and eventually lead to a communist society, a classless and stateless society where wealth is distributed evenly, property is owned publicly, and education is free for all. Marx died in 1883 and did not live to see his ideas flourish. Starting from the 1917 October Revolution in Russia, communism became a global movement that has since diversified into the many forms we see today. So what time did Karl Marx come from? How did he reach his conclusions about capitalism and other important concepts? How did different parts of the world embrace his thoughts? Joining us in the first section of our discussion, we have Associate Professor Deepanka Basu coming from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Welcome, sir. And also joining us in the studio, Associate Professor Christian Wu from Ghent University from Belgium. How did it start? What about his time that made him who he is as we remembered him? Karl Marx was a, a student in the University of uh, Berlin where he got influenced by ideas, radical ideas of the philosopher Hegel. Uh, and he was part of a group who was critical of Hegel, trying to understand the world in a materialist way. Mm. And that is the birth of Karl Marx as the thinker. Well, capitalism, that's always the key word in his works. But eventually, as capitalism evolved over the past 200 years, shall we say, and is still continuing, do you think his theory really worked? Well, he predicted a lot of things. Like what? Uh, such, for example, the, the globalization of capitalism. So when Marx was a young man uh, and developed his theories, um, capitalism was confined to England, no, not even Great Britain, but England, uh, Belgium, yes. uh, and uh, parts of, no, of, of, of northern France and Westphalia in Germany. And, uh, and he, he, he saw, uh, by studying the logics of, 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 of capitalism, he, he saw or concluded that it will uh, spread over the whole world, for example, and this is, this is something uh, which um, is, has become obviously true today. Mm. Not only capitalism, but also many of the things related to capitalism. Remember Karl Marx uh, in his works talk about crisis. Yes, crisis indeed. is another key word related to ca uh, capitalism throughout his works. So it seemed that worked, quote unquote. I remember the latest uh, column on New York Times is about, you're right. Yes. Marx. <laughs> Indeed. Yes. All about the, the capitalism and crisis. So, Mr. Basu, is he right? One of the main conclusions that Marx uh, drew our attention to was that capitalism as a system is always crisis born. It, it never is free of crisis. If we look at the history of capitalism over the past 200 years, it has been absolutely true. Mm. 1830s, 1870s, 1930s, 1970s, and then we are living through a crisis in 2008. Right. So his understanding of capitalism is precisely on the dot in terms of the crisis tendencies of capitalism. Mr. Marx probably could never have imagined that his theory probably is arguably having a bigger impact than any other philosopher in the world history. If you look at what we have gone through, through the Cold War and the recent development. But uh, let me ask you, how different countries, different cultures embrace or take advantage or make use 
of his series, how it has been different in different, how shall I say, locations and in different rhetorics? Well, um, with the spread or with the, with the globalization of the capitalist uh, um, social formation or the capitalist um, of capitalism, um, also uh, um, we saw a globalization of the, of the uh, related problems that accompany it. Uh, uh, the emergence of uh, a proletariat, uh, of a proletarian class, impoverishment, social problems, yeah. and so on and so forth. And, uh, and uh, for this reason, um, uh, Marx, um, as a most profound critic and, analy and, and analyzer of this system, uh, um, had an appeal for many intellectuals. Mm -hmm. so Remember, he was, he was not a favorite during his time. There However, were 11, 11 people coming to his, to his funeral. There so we go. You yeah. see the impact he made at the time of his own. Exactly. And yet, his theory spread around. You look at European countries. Uh, you also look at even here in Asia, Japan, China. How do you see that part of his theory being differently taken advantage of, of being made use of in different cultures? Briefly, I understand you have a lot of research about Japan and also briefly about China as well. Yeah. So um, um, the Communist Manifesto is, is translated in, if I'm not mistaken, 1906, yes. first in Japan, and um, ever since we see, uh, if, for example, and we see we see ever since then in the 1920s um, a very strong um, intellectual movement in Japan, which is then suppressed, of course, uh, during the, 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 the times of, of, of war and the interwar period, but after the war again it, it lives right. up. We see a reorganization of the left wing. We see a strong student movement emerging. It is becoming the leading ideo Marxism, the, the leading ideology or historical materialism in, uh, in historiography and so on and right, so but, forth. But the question even more fascinating than when it was popular in what country is why? Why these countries at these times began to be so interested in Marx series and believe that could be the way forward? I think that is the ultimate question, isn't it? Yes, so I can speak for India. So India grew out of an anti-colonial movement. During that anti-colonial movement, um, the Marxist framework provided answers to many questions of poverty, of development, of exploitation. That is why uh, a large body of, of people in India embraced Marxism. That is why it became popular. When is the time that you are talking about? 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. Very interesting. But you see also cultures, countries, nation states, make use of Marx series, but at the t same time, forget about it That's from <laughs> one time to another. Uh, you see Marx series are being mentioned repeatedly at the time of crisis. That's and yet his theories are not necessarily the favorite of everyone in the world when the crises are not happening. Mm -hmm. uh, is this the general uh, rule of how we see philosophy and philosophists, or his theory alone is quite unique, very briefly? He is providing us with very powerful... You're having a big smile on your face. <laughs> I know philosophists think differently from us, <laughs> but go ahead. So he has, he has, he has, he's providing us with very powerful tools to understand such crises. Um, and uh, I can tell you my students, which I have now, which are in the first year, mm. um, they have become conscious, politically conscious in, two, in, in 1908, now they are 18. Right. They have never experienced capitalism as something that is without problems. They only have experienced it as something that is in a crisis. I see. And so we, as we see a resurgent interest in Marx. You see young people, particularly as you yes. just mentioned, are extremely interested from time to time about Marx mm -hmm. uh, theories. You see that in the 1960s and 70s with the leftist movement going on inside the United States, for example. You also see China's Communist Party when it started. Very young people uh, that they are fascinated by this theory of Karl Marx and they develop something of their own for the future. So how do you see this combination? different times, young people, and different cultures at different historical stages. So one of the key insights of Marx was that he could look at the system critically and visualize something beyond capitalism. Young people always want change. When they see oppression, when they see poverty, they want to change the system. And Karl Marx provides a framework to think about that social change. 
That is why whenever the system gets into a crisis, the whole system gets, there is a question on the whole system and people start visualizing alternatives to the ex existing system. And that is when young people and, and, and the ideas of Karl Marx come together. Mm. Very interesting, as the, Mr. Plato said earlier, that philosopher is always beginning with wonder. And wonder is the feeling of philosophers. I guess that's why we are beginning by talking about where Karl Marx came from and how is he likely to have an impact on all of us for the future. Thank you so much for being with us, the two of you. Thank uh, you. Mr. Basu and Mr. Wu. Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. And you're watching World Insights special program marking the bicentennial celebration of Karl Marx's birthday. We'll be back after this. Welcome back. You're watching a special program of World Insight marking the 200th anniversary of the birthday of Karl Marx. Karl Marx, in the middle of the 19th century, came up with his revolutionary theory about how capitalism works and what the future would be like after it. But how relevant are his theories today? Joining us, we have their two very strong professors in this field. The professor Wang Hui, coming from Tsinghua University, he's actually recently organizing this discussion session in Tsinghua with the Tsinghua Institute for Advanced Studies of Humanities and Social Sciences about Karl Marx. Yes, Welcome to our program. Together with him working on that project, Associate Professor Li Ren, Mercy, I hope I pronounced your name right, Professor, yes. at University of Wisconsin-Madison, also joining us here in the Beijing studio. Welcome to both of you. I want to ask about that. Is this still relevant? After all, more than 200 years. Yes. That's what we're talking about. The world has changed. Professor? Well, I think um, I would say that he is very relevant. Um, but there are a couple of things we need to keep in mind because there is, uh, you know, since say 1989, the fall of the communists, uh, you know, and so on, there has been a tendency to sort of say, no, you know, Marxism, we tried that, but it's finished. Mm. But I think that what makes it relevant is that the problems of capitalism have actually become worse. And, and I think Marxism and Marxist texts are one of the places we can go to understand the logic of, of capitalism and try to understand how to, how to imagine a world beyond it. Mr. Marx is not the only one, if I remember right, with my very limited knowledge of mm -hmm. philosophy, though, uh, is not the only one to talk about the problem of capitalism. In fact, a lot of people talk about the problem yes. of capitalism. So why are we going back to his works these days, uh, Professor Wong? So much interest these days, you see, both yes. East and West about his works once again. I think that, uh, first of all, is a strength of theory mm. that gave the, at that time, the most profound the, the analysis about the crisis of capitalism and the uh, capitalism in crisis and to see that uh, how that the crisis happened again and again. And right, why according situation. to him if you could explain? At the same time, he, his analysis is not, on the one hand he's a, like a scientist to give analysis about capitalism but on the other hand he's an activist, a revolutionary. So he's not only his own as an individual theory, theorist but also the organizer and the political spiritual leader for the social movements mm. and the social revolutions. So that, that idea from there that the, the different kind of the efforts for change to capitalism was still developed. That's mm. why he's a living tradition. So we, when we talk about Marx, it's not only about the individual. Of course, he's a great thinker, but also the living tradition. Yeah. is a symbolic figure of the whole socialist tradition, I think. That mm. Before we go to the socialist tradition, let me focus a little bit about some of the key words in his uh, theories. One is about technology. Yes. So the advancement of technology is always related to the development of capitalism, which eventually would always cause or lead to crisis from time to time. How should we understand Professor Wang, for example, the latest development of technologies? I think during his time, his first re industrial yeah. revolution, now we are talking about the fourth industrial revolution yes. with artificial intelligence, robots yes. and everything. Yes. Even human beings likely to be replaced yeah. to a big extent. Sure. So Professor Wang, is his theory still relevant with us? I mean, we are talking about very different stages of technologies. First of all, the, the Marx in his uh, in his days, he's the, uh, he was the figure who was 
invest so much energy to study the natural science exactly. and the technology. Mm -hmm. And that he tried to integrate the analysis about technology innovation together with the analysis of a capital. So that's, I think, uh, he's, he's the figure to do that. That, the pro that match provo is very yeah, unique provide in the uh, certain kind of foundation for us to think about this issues but of course as you said that, that now there's so much development so the Marxism or the Marx tradition was not a dogmatic uh, dis uh, the, the issue mm -hmm. I think we are not uh, treat the Marx and his theory as a dogmatic is a real living tradition we try to learn some inspiration for our for our own, mm. for our own understanding or the interpretation about the new development here. So in that sense, we are not only goes back to the text the reading of that Marx, but also try to got some inspiration from his theory and then study the new developments in our society. Uh, is in Professor Wang having wishful thinking that uh, Mr. Karl Marx 200 years ago could still help us to find out what is going on right now with the latest round of technologies, uh, Mr. Murphy? Well, I think um, it's very interesting that you mentioned technology because that is, I think, at the center of a key concept of Marx, namely the concept of relative surplus value. Mm -hmm. And in that, he was talking about how, as capitalism develops, it tries to increase productivity. So although we're still talking about one hour is always 60 minutes, but how much you can produce in that hour becomes much, much greater. Yeah. And with that, what happens is the possibility of using all that technology for communal goods or, or for something that, that the society can control. But in capitalist society itself, what happens is that you get increased unemployment. Th technology actually doesn't liberate us all the time. It might liberate a few, but I think what Marx envisioned was a way in, we could, we, in which we could bring a lot of the science and technology under collective control. Mm. And that would be a, a possibility. So, so in some sense, it's a double-edged sword. On the one side, and as long as society remains capitalist, right. technology is going to cause us increasing problems. However, it also might open the way for a different type of society. Right. Okay. And capitalism could also be the engine that would encourage, according to him, uh, or theories related to his uh, about encouraging technological advancement. It definitely encourages technological advancement, but the problem is that technological advancement may not benefit everyone. In right. fact, yes. it's going to cause all kinds yeah. of problems. It's social impact. Yes. That's okay. what we are talking about, yes, right, right, Professor Wang? Right. Yeah. The other thing that he has been talking about, which is not really related to what is going on now, is the international system that we have today. At his time, the early time of the Industrial Revolution. Every country, nation state is in this, within its own little framework trying to develop on its own. But now we are having international system, particularly after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. The United Nations, for example, mm -hmm. the WTO, for example, mm -hmm. uh, institutions like IMF, World Bank, you also got regional thing, APEC, G20 things going on all at the same time. So Professor Wang, I mean, Mr. Marx has never seen a world like this. So his theory of, which is still based on countries, yeah. will that work today? No, his theory is not completely based on the uh, countries. Explain He's really this. for the talk about the international, internationalism, international movement, international solidarity among the workers, oppressed people, that how they can organize themselves. So in that sense, if we, of course, the UN or other in international institutions was fit to the contemporary capitalism, we talk about the global capitalism, but on the other hand, we can also see that the, uh, from 19th century, 20th century, a lot of the new developments absorbed a lot of the thinking from Marx and the whole, the, the, that socialist tradition. Mm. We see globalization, we also see quote-unquote de-globalization these days with, for example, the President of the United States, uh, being elected this process and also some of the uh, remarks he made about international system. So are we going back to, let's just say, even Marx's time about nation states once again, bilateral only? Uh, is his theory in that sense going to prove the most efficient and the most effective? Well, I think here we should begin to think about Marx in a, in a broader context and Go ahead. think about also the developments in Marxism. 
Because there's one concept that I think Marx may have, you know, pointed the way to, but perhaps not develop it completely, which is the concept of imperialism, which em emerges with Lenin and others, right? And so this is where you then talk about the international system, but in ways in which is ver are very unequal. But the thing is, this also allows us to see that globalization never meant the end of the nation state. Mm -hmm. Because imperialism was always using the nation state. Capitalism uses the nation state to expand. It cannot expand without the, the, the nation state. It actually needs mm -hmm. all things like laws and so on. Mm -hmm. And that's another way in which Marx continues to be relevant today. In fact, the more we have globalization, the more he becomes relevant. Uh, and I think that's, that, uh, that I think is something. But we also have deglobalization these yes, days. But the Therefore, that is the question. Exactly. Yeah. The deglobalization is very interesting because it's also, because we see that happening everywhere. But we see that also happening on the right and the left, mm -hmm. which shows us also. For different reasons. Exactly. But, but, well, the different reasons, but they're connected. Because what's happening is that people are getting to be upset with capitalism. Otherwise, we have to say, why is, how could Trump get elected? How could, why is there, why is there this populism everywhere? It's because people are getting upset or, or fed up with the mainstream that is constantly reproducing inequalities and all kinds of other issues. But problems. one question has to be raised, uh, just follow up what you have just said. Is people fed up with capitalism or is people fed up with the so-called political apparatus in those countries which practiced? capitalism. That's two different things. For example, in the United States, the complaint is, <laughs> as both of you may know very well, the slow and non-action of <laughs> the parliament and mm -hmm. also of the struggle within the different branches of the government. So mm -hmm. that's his question, rather than the capitalism itself, or is it? I think two cannot be separated. Because if you think about a lot of the people who are putting their hopes in, in Trump and so on, think about a lot of his policies, moving away from China and so on. It's to, love, to bring the jobs back to the people, right? That's very clearly capitalism. But it's, it's working at a, at a very incomplete understanding of capitalism, which is why his policies are not working, mm. right? So he's not actually able to do that. One but could almost tell your political tendency toward President <laughs> Trump in your answer. <laughs> but let me come back to you, uh, Professor Wang. You are understanding deglobalization, that trend apparently is going on. How should we understand that with what Mr. Marx was talking about in his works? Of, of course, that's the uh, situation is very different yes. now. But you can perceive that the, uh, the revival of the interest on the socialism, for example, even in like uh, Britain, the like could being born in Sanders in uh, Africa, that's a quite a mainstream. Mm. That sub suddenly means that the, that tradition attracted the people, to, not because of the Karl Marx, his, his own, but because the real crisis, they, they, they thought that we need to rethink alternatively not following the new level of thinking right. to, to deal with these kind of issues. Mm. It, it, in, in any case, it's not simply say the treat Marx as a dogma for us, but try to learn something from him and for our own struggle. Mm. That is very interesting. And another thing interested related to this is imperialism, the word you just used, and also hegemony. In a general sense, yes. the word being used. I understand from yes. you, Professor Wang, hegemony actually is a place that is being understood differently yeah. in different cultures. Yeah. It could be uh, a philosophical term. It yeah. could also be a political term. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Professor Wang, here's the thing. We can't talk about global north, global south. Yes. Let's just look at the U.S.-China thing as yeah. an example. Yeah. China believe developing countries, emerging economies should have its equal opportunity yes. for development, just as the developed economies used to enjoy. Yes. And by the way, according to Karl Marx, the developed economies were really exploiting the labors of the developing countries in order to have so-called surplus value, mm -hmm. if I remember right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <laughs> so Professor Wang, how do you see that the issue of global north and south the equal development opportunity vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the Karl Marx series about capitalism. That's a lot of the different analysis about that. Mm -hmm. A lot of the analysis in that time, maybe now the political economists are not, not re really the agree every, in, on every aspect with Karl Marx's analysis about that. What about yours? But, but generally speaking, 
that the uneven or the un unequal relations in this world were still there. So the developing countries were in the de not really in a good position. Mm. So in that sense, was still the, the certain kind of the idea. The so if you visit Africa or the Latin America or those countries, obviously they thought that uh, they need the certain kind of the power in the global affairs and also enjoy have the, the right for their own developments. Mm. That's that's the uh, the uh, change the global structure mm. for the redistribution. That's that's the, the still the big issue. I mm. think it is a big issue, yeah. Mr. Murphy, and therefore uh, I want to go to you about that. There's always the debate about hegemony yeah. uh, between the east and the west, yes, between yeah. the north and the mm -hmm. south, and particularly in recent years when. Once again, looking at the United States, when the system, international system, even established mainly by the United States and its allies after the Second World War, once it is not to the best interest of the latter, they wanted to change. Mm -hmm. And yet, the developing countries, emerging economies are saying, wait, 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 you led us to come into the system. Mm -hmm. And you say this is going to be the system that's going to benefit all. And you show to us that's how it's benefiting yours. But now you want to withdraw and say, let's just destroy the system. Mm -hmm. Why do you do that? That is <laughs> not fair. So here's the thing, once again, going back mm -hmm. to our theory discussion. Mm -hmm. It sounds abstract, but it's not. Mm -hmm. It is actually going yes. on every day, Absolutely. Mr. Murphy. I think the serious issue to think about here, um, and this may not directly address what you were saying, but is to think about the system itself as an unequal system. Right, And so that from the very beginning, the system tries to pretend that it's equal, yeah. but it's e actually always sort of, in some sense, But here is the thing, person. what is the alternative? Is the alternative less equal, or is the alternative more equal? Yes. Is there a alternative? So that I is the question. The, the, the alternative is definitely Professor more Wong equal. Come in later. It's, it's more equal, but we have to realize that more equal is not going to be very easily attainable in this system. Mm. So this is where, in the earlier question, when we were talking about development and, and the developing countries, what's very interesting is to try to think the relationship between development and capitalism. Is it possible to have non-capitalist development? Yes. Is it and if that's possible, then with the developing countries at one point, I mean, when you had this idea of third worldism and so on, there was the possibility of an alternative. That was really the attempt to, 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 to find another alter alternative exactly. of development, which then would perhaps in the future, the idea is to create a, a new system. Because socialism cannot just exist in one country. It has to transform the whole global system. Mm. So it's always a global movement. So what we see here are the contradictions within the capitalist world system, which are, is always going to be un, uh, unequal. Mm. It, that's part of the system. So this is the way in which we have to think capitalism always exists with imperialism and un uh, inequality. But, yeah, but at the same time, I see Professor Wang, within the system, you say, for example, nation state, a capitalist the country, there is an equal opportunity, the issue of that. Right. But on a larger scale, there's probably even more uh, between countries. That is the question, isn't it? Yeah. At least uh, now for the global south. Yeah, because you look at that, we put this issue from the long historical transformation, meaning that uh, if you look at the, what happened in the 19th century yeah. and the early 20th century, most of the nations were oppressed their col colonies and so on and so forth, that the imperial center can easily to got the resources from this area, mm. can in, in, in exploit those cheap labors from those countries. So the 19th century, 20th century, you perceive a lot of the national liberation movements, social movements, workers' movements, peasants' movements, in everywhere. Right. So that, at least for now, we can recognize certain kind of achievements from that the social movements. May China, for, exam for example, a much strong mm -hmm. position in the global affairs. So you can bargaining, you can negotiate with America or other countries. So now they made that, uh, that before that the people will argue that the UN, for example, were only the tools for them. Mm -hmm. But now certain kind of platform for those countries. So then disli they dislike this kind of platform. They even want to change the whole game. Uh, the whole game. Mm -hmm. So that's the, uh, you can see that the, that the social change was really inspired by 
that not only Marx, but the whole living socialist tradition. I see. Yeah. Very fascinating discussion. Yeah. But I have to wrap it up for this yeah. uh, second part of our <laughs> discussion. You're watching a special program of World Inside with Tianwei, focusing on the 200th anniversary of the birthday of Karl Marx and the impact of the series, relevancy of the series today. We'll be back after this. Welcome back. China is celebrating the 200th anniversary of Karl Marx's birthday this week. His ideas fueled socialism, something the country was founded on with Chinese characteristics. So how is that related to Marx's theories? What inspirations can China still get today from those ideas coming from Karl Marx? Joining us once again, we have Professor Wang Hui from Tsinghua University. Welcome back, sir. And also, this time for this section, uh, lecturer of the School of Arts Institute of Chicago, uh, Mr. Saul Thomas. Welcome as well. Socialism with Chinese characteristics. You earlier said, Professor Wang, that is an offspring of the theory related to Karl Marx. Really? Yes, of course. That uh, related to this theory. Mm. But it's not only for the theory, but it's, uh, it came, you know, the, the whole social system now in China, existing in China, was the result of the uh, long transformation yes. and uh, that what I called the long Chinese revolution. So in that revolution was part of the general, mm. the, the social movements in the globally, and for the Asia or the in China with its own characteristics, mm. I think. And you see socialism is still with China, Mr. Thomas, uh, during the Cold War? and now decades after the Cold War. How do you see the special characteristics, as the Chinese always say, about its uh, social form in a way, society form in a way, and how is that related to what we are talking about today, Karl Marx theories? Well, uh, there were um, some differences in uh, the society in China from Karl Marx's mm -hmm. uh, society. For example, China was uh, predominantly an agricultural uh, country at the time of the revolution. Yes. The revolution took place uh, uh, with the Communist Party organizing rural people for the most part. Rather than yeah. the workers. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. that, and that had a profound impact on, on the nature of the society that mm -hmm. was constructed. At the same time, there were many of the same problems that, that Karl Marx had talked about in terms of uh, 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 exploitation, and uh, sort of uh, uh, oppression of poor people in, in, in general, and also the problem of imperialism that Marx and uh, especially more Marxists afterwards uh, have written at length about. Uh, China suffered greatly under foreign imperialism mm -hmm. from various powers. And what about now? Uh, whether China Reform and opening up, that China is celebrating for the 40th anniversary of it. Uh, the question is, that's a very different socialism if you look at the, the dogma mm -hmm. uh, theories yes. of a socialism. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see that? There is a lot of debate now on how to consider the situation in China now. So you'll hear different uh, uh, answers from different Marxists. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or non-Marxists. Or <laughs> plenty of non-Marxists as well. Uh, uh, there has certainly been a, a great deal of development in the past uh, 20 years. Uh, uh, wealth has, uh, has, has increased. A, a number of problems have also emerged uh, that, that uh, weren't here before. For example, mm. the, the uh, uh, divergence between the, the wealthiest and the poorest has yeah. grown very greatly in China. So this right. is one uh, uh, aspect of society uh, that uh, we could use Marx to analyze. Right. One of the things are two concepts. One is the political party. Yes. The role of the political party in China's socialism, mm -hmm. which China believes is related to the basic theory mm -hmm. of Marx. Uh, the other thing is about so-called Chinese characteristics. Mm -hmm. Those are two very interesting concepts related mm -hmm. to what China is today. Professor Wang, you've been researching about mm -hmm. these concepts. Mm -hmm. Help us to understand briefly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's difficult to it briefly. It is difficult to briefly, but, I know. Uh, but on the other hand, I think the Communist Party, as I said, that there was shaped and reshaped in the 20th century for different, different periods. We know that the starting from the very beginning was 1921 was formally established under the huge influence on the Soviet Union 
and the international communist movements. So that was a small group of intellectuals. And so that later Mao said that it's October Revolution mm -hmm. sent us the Marxism. So not directly from Karl Marx, though the translation and in introduction of Marx theory was happened much earlier. Mm -hmm. It's before the 1911 revolution, but mainly it was after the October Revolution, the Soviet Union is So okay. the Soviet uh, Revolution. So, but afterwards, as uh, the Saul said that uh, in the peasant revolution and the long people's war, that the party was transformed again. So it's difficult to define such a political party compared to any other parties, right. from, even compared to other uh, communist parties. So it's a very, uh, just in that's quite a singular mm. in the Chinese history. So it's, it's, I think it's, you cannot find the uh, simple definition of these kind of the party to mm. define the Communist Party in China in that sense. The other thing, if I could invite your advice too about, is this concept between capitalism and the market. Yeah. As we understand from Mr. Marx's theories, these two concepts are somewhat quite related to one another. Yeah. And yet with China's practice, particularly mm -hmm. during reform and opening up, these two could be very different concepts. Yeah. Uh, Professor Wang, how do you see these unique combinations yes. of theories? I think the Karl Marx, he did the analysis about the capitalist market economy mm. to see that the, we talk about the labor, capital, surplus value, and so on and so forth. That was given the certain kind of historical phenomena yes. in the 19th century Britain, uh, the England at that time with the example for him. But on the other hand, a lot of the historians who influenced by Marx theory, but trying to make some certain kind of distinction between the capitalism and the market. Mm -hmm. The market economy and the market was different. The market economy more or less equal to the concept of the capitalism, mm -hmm. but the market itself as a mechanism, we can find that it existed for quite long uh, history that you may be traced back to the thousand years, but that only in the 19, at least after the England Industrial Revolution, then that transformed gradually to these kind of the stage of the, the market economy, dominant every social sphere. So that was different from the early market mechanism. Mm. Now, how can we, in after, the, in the, after the socialist revolution, after the transformation right. in China, how can we use that? Became a big challenge. So that's the, uh, the why the people rethink about the relationship mm. between the, not only the capitalism and the market, but also the socialism and the market. Exactly. So Mr. Thomas, your thoughts here. You. Well, uh, there have been some changes since uh, the market was, was introduced, uh, and there have been some, uh, some trends where the market has uh, come to play a larger and larger role within the society. There are still uh, some areas within China uh, that are uh, sort of protected from the market. For example, uh, uh, the question of land, especially in the rural areas, it's protected from the market. This is one of the legacies of the revolutionary period. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I guess this will be the question, is if, if China is going to, to maintain these legacies uh, from the socialist period mm. or, or uh, completely uh, embrace the market completely. And, and that, then there will be a question as to uh, uh, how much of a difference there will be between right. China as a, as a market society or just full capitalism. Yeah. Right. China talk about political theories. Yes. But our discussion today is mm -hmm. totally mm -hmm. intellectual mm -hmm. discussion. Before we go, I do want to ask you about that. Uh, how are we going to see where the future is? How much pragmatism, another big word, mm -hmm. is likely to play its role in mm -hmm. wherever we are heading for? Yes, we, are, we need to think about that. Uh, now we talk about that we need to remember what's the original starting point for us 
I think that the, because that starting point was really started from 19th, 20th century mm -hmm. in the real crisis, in the national crisis and the social crisis and the so on and so forth. Right. So that's the beneficial to everybody, serve to the people. All the people should become the master of our own society, not allow right. the small group of people dominant everywhere. Okay. So that's, I think, that the, from the beginning. So I think that showed that we need a certain kind of the new model toward that direction mm. was still the necessary. Right. I, think. I heard the not tradition. only pragmatism but also yes. idealism going yes, on over right. there That's as well. All, yes, of course. It's all, always related to the ideas. <laughs> for <laughs> for <laughs> the pragmatism. Yes, That's okay, all, there all we go. Wang yeah. Hui yeah. and the Saul Thomas, thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us. Really appreciate it. Yes, and that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and seen a wave from Etienne Wei and everyone on the World Inside team. Thanks for watching and tune in again next time for Insights of China and Thank you so much.